record. Welcome back to the Heavy Business Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, joined as always by co-host of the podcast, co-founder of C-Squared, possibly the drummer of Ghost, no one really knows for sure, Mr. Curtis Dewar. Hello, hello. And we have an awesome guest today, super stoked, uh, celebrating 15 years of apologies for the week, hometown hero in my neck of the woods, repping a Cincy t-shirt, the vocalist of Miss May I, Levi Benton. Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on. So, where's your hometown? Wait, am I am I close to you? Dude, we're like two blocks apart right now. Yes, awesome. I, I'm in, I'm in Newport. Um, Same. You and I, do we live in like parallel universes? So like, you're on the west side of the Mammoth Divide. I'm on the east side. You've got your oh. signature drink at a uh, Trailhead, right yes. across the street from Jet Age, where my signature drink is sold. Dude, I almost went and got one like an hour ago. <laughs> it's a, it's an interesting <laughs> concept. Lemonade espresso. I'm gonna have to try it today. It's good. Wow. Lemonade, it's cool. Wait, 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 wait. Lemonade espresso? That's a thing? Yeah, that's a thing. Wow. Yeah, you. Uh, it's an Americano. Just instead of water, you put lemonade. It's like a summer drink. Interesting. Cool. It sounds like it could be potentially refreshing, potentially weird, but I'm going to have to go get one and let you know how I feel about it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so let's roll back the clock, man. 2009, Devil Wears Prada is blowing up. Like everything Rise Records touches seems to turn to gold at the time. You're a high school kid, I believe, in 2009. You're walking yeah. into an inconspicuous little dirty garage in Connersville, Indiana, about to lay down some tracks. You know the garage I'm talking about. Did you have any expectations going into that recording session for the album you were about to create? And, and could you have ever imagined that you would be re-recording those albums in 2024? No, it's it's definitely... it's. It's crazy and surreal. Like I always tell everybody there's this the story when we're meeting the label heads, like um, because at the time we're all working at Burger King or like just trying to figure it out. And to even get CDs or t-shirts pressed was a lot. So to us, the record label was like, wow, they're gonna pay for our CD sleeve. And I remember like just talking to the label, I'm like, I just want to sell one sleeve. And he's like, and then I'll never forget they like patted me on the back and they were like, We're gonna sell way more than one sleeve. <laughs> and it was just like such a typical like vh1 movie record label guy being like oh this will be this will be great and like our expectations were so low because we just wanted we just wanted like a professionally printed version of our music we never thought about like the trajectory of people hearing it like we just wanted something to be like we made this and then yeah it's crazy all these years later and that that album's sort of stuck through time like it's, it's not really dated it's nice yeah, it's like with modern production, it actually, it sounds very current. Like, it doesn't sound like an album from 15 years ago, which I think is a testament to the writing on that album. You listen to a lot of other albums from that that period, you know, even some of the, the Rise albums, they didn't age as well as that album did. So, you know, kudos. I know, that. it's crazy. The good good thing are uh, we don't have to dress like we did 15 years ago. That definitely did not age as well. <laughs> as, <laughs> I, as I love looking back at the, those old pictures, man. We all looked goofy back then and... Yeah, you know, the scene the scene was funny back then. I think you guys yeah, you played could. a lot of the same venues we did, you know, like the you know, the the attic and you know underground and some of those sort of places. And yeah, like we all we were all walking stereotype, you know. It's it was it was a phase. Yeah, <laughs> that was pre was... tight pants in the men's section. You had to go and really <laughs> look for tight pants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people just got them in the uh, in the other section, but. Uh... <laughs> What I'd love to know, you know, so you've re-recorded these songs. I don't think a lot of people ever get a chance to like revisit an album they made so long ago. Obviously, Joey was in his very early stages. You know, he was sort of figuring things out. He was he was obviously he was really good. He was kind of ahead of his time, but like it was still like it was very primitive the way things were done back then when you'd make an album. What do you think the biggest difference was in making the album today versus making the album 15 years ago? I think the biggest thing is just our like talent and performances um, because back then it was, it was like an idea still of like, Hey, this is a, a low should be here. This should be a crazy high or crazy solo. And like, we knew what we wanted to make. So a lot of it is like, like a blender put together on the computer to make it happen. Uh, sort of like a fake it till you make it. Cause at the time too, we were only playing on the weekends so like we only knew how to play for 48 hours and then take a week off play for like we weren't really conditioned like we are now um so like a lot of the like low streams and high streams are like blended together or like pitch shifted and it was so nice to go back and be like oh i remember us like 
tweak in this because I didn't know what I was doing and now I can do it the proper way. So I think a lot of that really modernized the album too, because we've just got better at musician at musicianship. And it's funny because I remember those chapters sort of happening live too. It's like we'd play some of these songs live and it'd probably be like three or four months on tour. And then I'd finally hit it and I'm like, oh, I can finally do this part live. <laughs> like it took so long. But um we sort of yeah planned ahead. We like knew we were going to be touring nonstop. So we're like, we'll put this in and we'll if anything, it's going to make us work harder because now we have something to work towards. So, And where did you record this this time around? Uh, so our new guitar player, Elijah Mullins, um, he is, oh, what is the name? Um, Arch Archer Studios. Um, him and uh, Jack Daniels, I swear that's his name. They're both from War of Ages. Uh, they have a studio in Missouri and um, Kate Gerard, Gerardo. So that's, uh, so we worked at his studio. So um yeah it's it's awesome too it's it's nice to sort of dial back and do stuff ourselves too um it's a definitely definitely a cool environment that we've really never done we've always either went to real bougie studios or had like a hybrid thing to where we'd fly out producers so it was nice to just do it ourselves and you really didn't need a producer this time because the songs were kind of already uh already written exactly cool. yeah it's it's cool what to record the, uh... an album and have a reference track you're like, can you just play the reference to hear what we're supposed to be doing? <laughs> how, how much of the stuff do you think? Well, I think you have new guitarists, right? Are both of your guitarists new at this point? Yes. Yep. It's just Elijah now. So, so are you the only one that played on both iterations of this album? No, uh, me and Jared, uh, our drummer. Okay. So, yeah. So Ryan wasn't on this. Uh, he actually left the band only while we were in the studio. So he left before we went into the studio this guy named Josh Galepsi uh, recorded it. And then he only lasted one week on tour and then Ryan came back. So Ryan only missed the recording of the album. That's funny. So, so, so everybody had to learn the album essentially then. So that's kind of cool. When you, when you much, were going yeah. back, it, it, you know, not all songs age the same, you know, I, I do think most of these songs age pretty well, but you know, you wrote this stuff 15 years ago, like you were a different person 15 years ago. Were there, were there any songs that you were like, uh, I don't want to say hesitant, but maybe some that you were kind of like, eh, I don't know about revisiting this one or, uh, or maybe some that you were just really excited to like put a new spin on. Yeah, there was, there were actually wasn't any, I didn't want to revisit just, and I think the, what helps with that is we've always made, been like self-aware and made it a point to sort of be pretty vague, uh, purposely in our lyrical content to make it like very universal. Um, so I think that really helped. Um, and then, yeah, there was, it goes back to the performances. There was a lot of stuff like Arms of a Messiah was is like a very chaotic song. And I've always wanted to like go back and retrack it because I would never actually revisit listening to this album because I sort of hated my vocals on the original. Uh, I thought they were too harsh uh, just because like I just like I said, didn't know what I was doing. So it was nice to go back because I love playing the songs. I just hated hearing myself on the album. Um so a lot of it, I was excited to go back and be like, oh, I can't wait to do this or like not punch a line, like do the whole line in one breath. Like there was a lot of cool stuff that I'm like, oh, I can put a cool spin on this or a cool pronunciation to really uh, spice it up. Yeah. And I think you did a phenomenal job. I think that the, I think the re-recorded versions, I think they, they stay true enough to the originals, but like, again, they do feel modern. They feel fresh again, which is cool. That's what awesome. was the uh, what was the thought process on like putting a guest vocalist on every track? So that was sort of our only stipulation. Um, we are a band notorious for we just like to mix things up, and obviously sometimes that blows up in our face. Um, and sometimes, uh, or sorry, going into this, we've obviously had anniversaries come up um, for different things, and this came up with the label and. We're sort of in a downtime just because of parenthood right now. So it was like something to sort of fill our calendar. Um, but when we were going to do it and celebrate it, um, it just felt so stale just re-recording it and putting it out. So we were like, went to the drawing board of like, how can we spice this up? Should we add new songs to it? Like do DJ remixes, whatever, have some features. And then when that got brought up, we're like, what if we just just try to fill the whole album? Um, and then immediately the label and management were like, that's too much of a headache. That's not, that's not possible. Like it's, it sounds cool, but logistically it will be crazy. And we literally were like, give us the weekend and we'll figure it out. And then like literally 
I would say under 48 hours, I texted everyone on that, on the album and they all texted back anything you need, bro. I got you. Like, and they're like, I got all green lights. And then it was awesome. Cause the next week I just went to the label and I was like, don't worry about it. Everyone said yes. Like just send them the songs. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, it was such a good, which is awesome because it's all about the celebration and friends anyway. So it's cool. I know people don't know the behind the scenes, but behind the scenes, it was so awesome because it really did. It was just friends, like giving us high fives and like coming in and singing the songs with us. So it was awesome. I think a lot of the, a lot of the guest vocalists were bands you either played with early on or like on your first tours or, you know, sort of, yeah. sort of the people you met around that era, which kind of brought it full circle. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was one of our points. It was, it was cool too. Cause now there's an impending doom um, resurgence, but it was cool to bring Brooke sort of out of retirement a little bit and hit him up and be like, Hey, you took us on your first tour. Do you want to like jump behind the mic again and sing on some of these songs with us? And then it, the other cool thing was like, we've met bands along the way that we knew were inspired by that album. So it was cool to reach out to Currents and um, Sign of the Planet and know that they loved that album when they were inspired to start their bands. So it was cool to be like, Hey, do you want to same with Pit for King? Like they loved that album when they were starting Fit for a King. So it was cool to be like, hey, do you guys want to sing on the songs you love back then? Um, it was a cool full circle moment. Now, do you feel kind of like a proud dad when you watch a band like Currents or Fit for a King? Like these are bands that are killing it right now. And they were oh, inspired yeah. by your album and now they're on your album again, so. Yeah, it's 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 definitely crazy. Like, um, especially Currents, because we took them out in our first US tour and the first European tour. And now they're taking us out in Europe. And uh, it's just so awesome because like, yeah, I just remember, I remember being those guys going out with like Bleeding Through or Impending Doom or All That Remains and they're just like showing us the ropes and like what not to do and how to like condition yourself and it is cool to pay that forward. You always knew that time would come and it just sort of pops up one day and you're like, oh, it's here. We are, we are the old guys now. <laughs> you are the, you are the scene elder now. <laughs> exactly. So since we're on the topic of touring, we could shift gears and talk about touring now. You guys have a U.S. tour next month. I think it's pretty much the entire month of October. It wraps yep. up November 3rd. Uh, you're putting on a festival in, in Covington, Kentucky at Madison Theater, which is pretty cool. Relentless Fest. Um, have you guys had a chance to start playing these songs yet? Have you rehearsed as a band and actually run the set yet? Um, it's funny. The last three days and my chat is exploding like the last few days, too, of everyone rehearsing. Um so I think like we were, we had some new stuff we've been working on. So there is some new music for the tour. So that that's been sort of our main mindset, but we knew right when we were leaving the studio, which was like a couple weeks ago, we're like, Oh, when we leave the studio, we're going to have to start rehearsing for this freaking tour. And now it's the time has came. So uh, we've been rehearsing it. Um, it the, I think the hardest thing is there's so many of these tracks that have never made it to our live set, which is also exciting, but it's just like, Oof. And the reason they didn't make it our live set is they were a lot. So now we have to play them. Uh, so we, we will find out. It's also a lot of songs. So, I mean, if you're putting new songs in, so you're playing more than just the album in its entirety. Yes. Uh, the, the stage and the set is sort of like a, a double feature. So, um, which is really cool. We've, because it's sort of like a new chapter of Miss May I with new music coming out, a new lineup, um, sort of this, this, re-release is sort of like a a bookmark of like okay this was us this is a new chapter um we're also approaching the stage in our performance different which we've never done and i think because of that it just felt stale because we've played 1500 shows on tour so it's nice to go and be like well, how can we change this up and now's the time um so yeah it's like a two-part uh show which is which we're really excited i think people are gonna love it because every everything changes on stage when the the music changes so very cool that's awesome i can't wait to see it are you gonna so that'll be the same thing at the uh the madison show yep i don't know those fast yet yeah. it'll yeah. actually be scaled up for that show so it's that's the biggest show of the tour which we're really excited for and that's called relentless fest do i have that right yep relentless fest yeah so it used to it used to be relentless eve in dayton ohio um for a few years uh pre no post pandemic um and there's no really venues in Dayton. Um, so we were turning a wedding venue into a venue once a year. And I just think we were stressing the owners out because we were just, it was like one day a year it was really rowdy. The bar was packed. People are smashing stuff. And then they're like, it just got to a conversation of like, guys, you can't be coming up here doing this. And we're like, so we canceled it for a couple of years. 
And um, I don't know how many people know this, but Frank from the Mad Hatter purchased Madison Theater and we wanted to do something for the community. Um, and so we've been actually talking about this for years and uh, we finally pulled it this way and we moved it the time frame. So we moved it to more fall. It's easier to get, like we're bringing in Born of Osiris as a special guest and uh, it's an easier time of year to do some shows. So so did you book this whole thing yourself or were you working with Frank on that or? Yeah, so it's, our, it's ours and Frank. Yeah, so we um we have a beer that's going to be there, like a Miss May I beer. There's a lot of cool, um, we have some local food trucks. Uh, we have an after party up on the roof. Um, there's there's a lot of cool little um things to do. And, and the idea is every year the Madison Live will be locals um, for the community. And then the theater will be uh, international bands. So next year around this time, whether we're on tour or not, we're going to fly in four or five international bands for this show um, and just try to, yeah, just, you know how it was like when, early to like early 2000s the the metal scene was just crazy and it was it was really based around community and sort of all the venues have been purchased up by the big companies which is fine they make them great and they keep them sustained but it sort of lost that community aspect so this one being locally owned we're sort of coming in and being like let's keep it community based and sort of bring back that vibe of like those unicorn fests and those floor shows like back in the day so yeah, that's awesome, man. Do you do you prefer um, doing a headlining tour or would you rather be a support on another tour? I mean, as far as stress level, planning, production, all that sort of stuff, like how do you view the two? Um, I do not like headlining. <laughs> it's so stressful. Uh, I love the show and it is very, the crowds are the best headlining because it's your crowd. Like if no one wants to see you, they can leave at that point. Um, so it's awesome to just play to your people. Um, but I love the challenge of winning people over. So I love festivals. I love supporting because I sort of have to work harder on our show because I have to win these people over that don't like us. And it's awesome to watch them from the first song to the 10th song be nodding their head and having a Miss May I shirt in their, um, in their hands. But in like, in the stress level of like, Oh, if the show's not doing great or it's not up to us uh, and just being done earlier, there's, there's a lot of perks of supporting, um, but headlining, it's becoming more fun the older we're getting because I think our, I think this might be our, the most fun we've had headlining because it's a theatrical set other than just like jumping up there and putting cabs and lights and being as crazy as we can. It's more theatrical. Um, so I think I might like that because it's more of a performance every night, not really just, uh, playing with your dudes, um. So, and obviously we haven't done it yet. So it's right now it's just on paper and there's digital mock-ups and stuff. So until it's actually done, I don't know how much I like it, but I think this is a new chapter for us to sort of like headlining more. And it just reminds me of like, when you see Avenged or Lamb of God, or um, see, I know you made a ghost joke earlier, but like those bands, there's like a, uh, it's, it's a show show. It's like, you're going to see something at like, uh, yeah, like a theater. And we we're sort of growing into that for this tour. And I think, uh, that might make, I might like that. Cause there's going to be cues and some movements. I have to like, there's, I don't, instead of just thinking about playing, I'm actually, there's so many other things I'm thinking about. That's just going to make it like, a let's get to the finish line. Let's get to the finish line. So <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's big boy stuff. You're doing big guy stuff now, you know, you're We're not trying. just throwing your, you're not just playing 45 minutes and running off the stage and, you know, going back to the van it, or whatever. That's yeah. It's a lot different it's than funny, when you wrote I think, this album the first time, you know? Oh, I so, dude, yeah. I remember this first album, all we wanted was road cases. And now it's like, we have all this other stuff that I'm like, oh my gosh, I would have never thought I'd been standing on a lighting QX for this song. <laughs> like that didn't exist. It was just like two stick PAs. We're playing like somebody's garage when we've released this album. So it's cool. News. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. So I have to ask you, since you, you said the magic word here, you had a tweet um 2023 i believe you had responded to a tweet and uh you had talked about touring with avenge sevenfold i'm gonna just quote you you said yo did a whole summer festival tour with avenge sevenfold came home with 400 dollars each i feel this to my core starving artists is a real thing i don't think i've ever seen anyone ask you about this tweet so i'm sorry if you've been asked about it a thousand times 
But like, I want to know how in the hell this happened. Like, can we talk about that? You okay talking yeah. about that? Yeah, no, that we can totally. It's so funny. This tweet has haunted me uh, since I posted that, uh, which people never want to know behind the curtains. Um, well, that's what I we talk might... about on this show. So I mean, we're all about our, behind the curtains. That's our whole modus operandi, dude. Yeah. No, that it's it's good. So long, long story short, um, we were in like the doing everything you're not supposed to do in an all older bands tell you not to do of like keep your rights own all your stuff do that we were just kids we didn't really have bills as much like now we're we have different we got famous so young that we were just being kids for a long time so even though people told us not to do these things we signed every bad contract you can imagine um and they're not even bad i'm not gonna say the bad they say they helped our career got us to where we're at but you gotta sort of pay your dues when you sign those things um and yeah so we just didn't we were crushed on that tour but we didn't really um have the rights or own a lot of our stuff and it was the and um the people that were looking after our finances were looking at it a different way than what we were doing um which we changed our team soon after that tour because of all this um but yeah it was a surprise to us too we came home and i'll never forget that phone call of like hey so this is all that's left at the end of the tour and it was just like what and like we were just out for 40 days in the summer like crushing on mayhem um and yeah it's just it's sort of uh yeah just the the people that looked after our stuff just didn't look after it the right way and um i think we've learned our lesson that's sort of like i said it's nice doing the diy uh studio stuff and all that we because we were so young we are guilty of handing the wheels and reins over to everyone because we just wanted to play and we didn't know we weren't adults we were like 16 17 and so we were like yeah you guys got this and people did get it and they they did take care of us but there was also mistakes along the way because we weren't it was out of sight out of mind to us we were just playing shows um so when that started happening the older we got we started buying houses and we started like having real bills we're like oh man like we should probably looking at our stuff more um instead of having all these other people control it and uh i think that's been our biggest change probably 2017 18 to now is we've sort of taken control of miss may i back um not like i said there's no nobody did any harm like i'm not throwing any shade our managers and teams have been awesome this whole time it's just we would have done things differently to to secure our futures um as opposed to like doing the stuff we did but so to go back, here's a good example of like, we're talking about doing this theatrical show. This is a way smaller tour than the headliner we did in 2012 uh, for the AP tour. We had 30 cabs on stage and all this. Stuff. We were just being kids, blowing stuff. Like we could have done a cool theatrical show with Pyro and all that then. But being kids, we we're like, let's put 30 cabs on. Like how much crap can we put on there? There was no thought of like what the show was because we were just playing breakdowns stopping a song there was no samples or like no lighting effects it was just like a bunch of dudes with a check and we're like how much stuff can we do with this uh and it was just like being kids so like i look back on it and i love those experiences i love that we did do that um but i would have probably done it differently <laughs> now being an adult and a parent and it just that uh, comes with life so yeah so that answered my next question like what did you learn from from the event sevenfold tour and you know, what you would do differently. But, um, you know, for bands coming up, I think that's really important. I think that a lot of bands have that similar mentality of like, oh, it's our first tour. We got to get, a, we got to get a bus, you know, we got to get this, we got to get that, you know, we got to, we got to print all this merch and, and, you know, pay $15 a shirt or, you know, whatever, you know, you spend the yeah. money and you don't think about the, the repercussions of all the money you're spending. If you had just spent a little less up front, or if you had budgeted a tour a little better, or like, you know, maybe, got a bandwagon instead of a bus you might have come home with a little money in your pocket but you know people don't think yeah. about that until they until they get the settlement at the end of the tour and go what the hell happened so yeah we did that for a really long time and it was just, the other thing that didn't help was we toured nonstop for like 10 years like we never we were home probably like 60 days a year for 10 years so like you never really got to feel the burn of what happened until like honestly until the pandemic until we stopped touring we like really never looked at our books until we're like holy crap like Cause we would just play it. We would just keep playing shows. So if there's a deficit, we're like, let's just play another show. It was, just, it was just one big train engine for a decade. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget, like you were talking about Fifth or King earlier, like 
Kirby, their singer, he's like an accountant. Like he is, that's like his thing. And they are so smart. And I remember touring with him and them just showing us how they do stuff. And I'm like, we do it way backwards. Like, uh, but it, it was cool to learn. And like, now they're where they're at because of that. And they have the things they have because of what they did. Uh, we were just, I, I'll always go back and not that I'm blaming, but I always just go back on like, we were just so young when our fame happened that we just, and we were, we were all broke kids except BJ, our guitar player. We were all just like, since we were 16 or 17, we were making more than our parents. So they didn't, there was no advice coming from them. We were just like, ah, this is freaking crazy. And then it was all gone. <laughs> So it it's like a tale as old as time, man. But you exactly, didn't... dude, you would. That's why I don't get mad. Cause I'm like, oh, this is this happens it's like, all the time. Right. A passage. But you came out on the other side. You're better off for it. You know, and here you are. You get a second chance to to do it all over again and right the wrongs of the past. So you've got new management. You got sounds like you got a good team behind you. You recently yeah. switched record labels. And I think you may have switched record labels twice. You were you were a rise band for the longest time. Uh, then you were, I believe, on Sharp Tone for a, one album yeah. or two? Uh, one. One. And so yeah. you did a one album? Oh, no, two, in... two. Sorry. Did two you do two? Existence. Okay. Yeah. That's what and I did. Okay, it kinda... sort of doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, I, I feel anything that happened for the last like four years is a blur in my mind. It's like a bad dream or something. Yeah. But now you are on solid state? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So should we assume that there's going to be another album after this anniversary album? Will it be a new album? Yeah, so we're already working on new music. There will be some new music for this tour. Um, and yeah, there, there will be new a new album. Um, I don't know a timeline at all, but we are working on new material. Um, and when we change labels, there's never any bad things. I always just say like, it goes back to the staleness. Not that the labels are stale, but we just like something new. We've been doing this for so long. So when our contracts are up and there's like the re-up option, we always shop around just to like, you could bring what you learned from the prior label to the new label, see what they do. And you could just keep doing that. And that's sort of how we do it. It's just like, how do you guys run things? Like we've done it this way. Um, and we're still friends with everyone we've ever worked with. It's just, um, yeah, just something fresh every time. So this was our contract was up with Sharp Tone and we shopped around and, um, we were a different animal this time because we're not touring as much. So it's not as appetizing to all these labels because we're obviously a product to be sold. And if we're like saying, Hey, we have kids, we want to just do like a tour to a year for right now, not forever, just while they're little. Um, a lot of people obviously weren't stoked about that because they're used to the 10 month a year of Miss May I. Um, so that, that definitely slimmed down our options, but solid state, um, has been changing a lot of stuff on their end as well. And they were like, do it. Like we trust you guys, do whatever you want to do. We'd love to be your next home. And it's been awesome because we've been doing everything we wanted to do without any like pushback. And it's been the best numbers we've ever had. So. Yeah. I mean, you guys are killing it on Spotify right now. I think your numbers have doubled since you dropped the, uh, the re-release. So yeah, it's crazy. We broke a million a couple days ago and went back down. So we're pushing it back up again, but it was just like, that's never, even on like shadows inside and Hey, Mr. And all that stuff, like it never was where it's at now. So it's, it's really cool. Yeah, dude. It's awesome, man. I'm super stoked for you guys. So you. um you talk about working on tour. I, I know you have a, a strong work ethic, but it seems it, it's very relevant. I mean, I think a lot of bands now can't tour 10 months a year. It's just too damn expensive. Life happens touring is ungodly expensive but you did talk about working on tour so you're making it work but um you started a company called sick dude and i want to ask you about this so you you said something about you're always on your laptop on tour and um you are building really cool websites you're doing some development stuff some design stuff i want to know how this came about yeah so i've always i i think one of our biggest sort of um hype things back in the day when we were MySpace band was I was doing development then as like 14, 15 year old, um, just fell in love with it. I honestly did one MySpace for a band when I was like 14 and it was the amount of money I made for an entire week at Burger King. And I was like, I will never go back to Burger King. And I just dove into coding. Um, I wanted to go to school for that before the deal came in. Um, then we were touring. I've always worked for, I worked for Rise in the back end. I worked for Sharp Tone. I still do all of Sharp Tone's development. Um, so I was always doing it behind the curtains and never really announced it. Um, 
And then the pandemic happened and um, I was still, I was working for even more people. I was working for AP and doing all this stuff, but, and rewind a little bit. I had the company Versa Limited from 2010 to like for 20 years to 2000 or 10 years to 2020. Um, And I always did that development and those sales and everything. Um, And it was just a fun thing to do like on the side while I was touring and um, I got really good at it. And when the pandemic happened, I, uh, I got my first big contract with a flex seal. I still do all their stuff too. Um, But it also showed me, this is before sick dude started. It also showed me, Hey, all these friends of mine and peers and entertainers have these online stores. People are buying the most stuff they've ever bought online because they can't leave their house right now. I should, help all my friends out and all these labels out. So I started sick dude and I hired a few guys and we've just never stopped. So we basically have went in and we work for more people than just music now, but it was mainly just, we targeted music and we went in and fixed up everyone's sites and stores and was like, Hey, let me like, you could turn it on, but there's a better way to do it. So we'd pop up in the hood, tinker some stuff and just helping a bunch of friends make money has been awesome because, um, yeah, it's just a whole nother revenue stream, especially when there was no shows like, um, and yeah, we just, I'm obsessed with it. I was uh, on a call before here, um, just doing some more stores and sites. Uh, and I do it on tour and it's, it's cool because it keeps me in music and I get a, I get to do my favorite part of our band all the time with other people. Like I love the art and build of our band, uh, but we only get to do that as Miss May I every couple of years. And now I get to do it every day with all these new albums for other people. So it's like, I get new artwork and a new album like every day. And I have to create yeah. something about it. And I'm like, let's freaking go. So it does seem, yeah. I mean, I follow, I follow the sick dude Instagram page and everybody else should too, especially if you're looking for a website or design or anything like that. But um, yeah, it, I, it, it came out of nowhere, I guess, during the pandemic, but it seemed like there was a new project, like every five days, you're making me look bad, man. Like I'm a developer designer. I'm way slower than you are. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know if you, if you had, if you had some of these things front loaded and you're just kind of like blasting them out, you know, for, for, um, getting the word out. But yeah, it's like, I think you did some stuff for like SLA dying. Like, oh, yeah. uh, I saw, I saw some of the, the, you know, the flex seal stuff and whatever, but yeah, I mean, it, have a lot of people figured out that you're doing this is your phone blowing up for, uh, for this kind of help now. So it's funny, Instagram was the first time going public. So from the beginning of the pandemic until that Instagram was just like three weeks ago, we were just word of mouth because we were just so busy. Um, and we just wanted to ramp up work. So we actually, that was like our first time going like public. Like our website for the longest time was just a button that said email us. And it was just no portfolio or anything because it was like, it was just word of mouth. Like it was just like, if you know us, you'll find us. Um, and now, yeah, we've been doing, it's been insane since we started Instagram, it has definitely been insane. Um, but in a good way, we're just setting up new things. Um, we're, we're, we just got into applications. So we're doing some big boy development lately, um, which I'm very excited to launch some of the stuff we're doing. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's something I'm like super passionate and love. And the fun thing is it's a cool creative outlet, keeping it within music because there's just so much uncharted territory of like how we can make this better and cooler and with, especially with the times changing and getting more technological anyways, it's like, it's like a new frontier. It's awesome. So yeah. Band websites have been historically atrocious for like the last, you know, that's, 20 years. that's my sales pitch. I Man, know, you know, yeah, that mine too. You know, it's like, you, you don't have to have this like horrid geo cities looking dated, you know, I don't know, but yeah, I mean, dude, you you did a site for like bad omens, ice nine kills. Like I'm going through your list here, man. These are some heavy hitters. Like you're, you're doing it, man. So that's super cool. So, I mean, that's something that, you know, you say you got a team working for you. You can never beat, you know, just for you young dudes, like you can never beat uh, what I would call like a passive income revenue where you've got a team of people working for you. You can go on tour. You don't have to come home and worry if you're going to be able to like keep the lights on because you've got this other stuff going on. So side hustles are like all the rage. And I feel like if you're going to be in a successful band, especially a band that tours, you have to have more than than one income stream coming in i just it's the reality of the times we're living in I everyone wanted, i know even, I wanted, even to the biggest oh sorry keep going i was gonna ask ahead, you please. actually uh levi um one thing that a lot of bands come to us about like we do pr and they say i don't need a website because i have an instagram page facebook page can you kind of go over why they need that because i try to explain it to them kind of over their head so let's yeah, hear you yeah. explain it 
So one of our big pushes is we develop Shopify themes from scratch. And the reason we develop on Shopify code is because it can do the conversions in e-commerce. So what we were seeing was like, so like you're saying, if a band has an Instagram or a Twitter, they have all these links that they're pushing out and they're trying to get people to go to. And the reason we code the way we do and sort of consolidate the website and the store into one is because the conversions are just so much higher if you're just sending one URL out. So if it's even with music videos and stuff, it's like, why send them to your YouTube if you can embed it and have the same thing on your site? So it's just like, we just put into people's head to drill their website into people's, instead of like, because the label also is sharing, like you have to think PR teams, labels, yep. other band members, everyone's sharing these links. And 99% of the time, it's not the right, or it's not the same link. They're sending them all over the place. Um, and if you, the other thing is like getting the data, like if you could send them to one place, you're getting all the data from one funnel instead of all these things you're trying to collect all this data and bring it together to use for marketing. That's not going to work. So it's like for bad omens, they had like badomens.com and then they had store.badomens was a completely different website hosted. So it's like we brought those two together and you could go on bad omens and go to videos and see every music video. You can go to their albums and look all their album. Like you could do everything from a site without ever leaving the website and then also promote your new t-shirts or albums and stuff so that's why that's our big pitch is just like the consolidating is um is the best the, the only time we ever run into issues is like with these bigger bands some merch companies just have like a lock on those websites which is fine we work a way around it and try to be creative but and if that does happen the store dot whatever the band name is dot com does work as well because you're keeping in there for conversions but if you can slim it down to one url that is key. Um, and obviously socials are, are cool and stuff, but even your socials, if your link to is that one link and it has everything there, you're going to, the traffic, everyone's just going to, that's the promotion, you know? So I think that is the best explanation I've ever heard for it. Yeah. <laughs> it, just, it helps like, and you'll see the convert, like the, one of my coolest, um, I won't say the, the band name, um, but I did this band recently. Um, and, we're not cheap because it's a lot of work. Um, and they were just like on the fence of like, Hey, should we do this? Should we not? And I was like, well, here's some of our like stats. Like I think it'll help you guys. And what they make in one year of their online store, when we consolidate everything, they made that amount in 12 hours and they've wow. been making that ever since. And it's been on for four months. And they're just like, this is crazy. This helps us tour so much. This is like, we have so much more revenue. I was like, cause they were sending people all over the place. So we just consolidated it. And then, everyone's going to the same place to buy their new t-shirts or music or see what they're doing. And they just keep using that. So. And what kind of budget should a band be looking at if they're going to get a website, like not even necessarily just from you, but in general, how much would you say they should be budgeting? Um, well, the, the cool thing is a lot of stuff is becoming more user-friendly, especially with like AI and all that. Um, and like in theme builders, like one of my dreams is to make, and this will happen in the next couple of years is I want to make like a band theme that we could just give to people for 20 bucks. Like you can, you for the startup bands that just can like be a little bit savvy, do their own graphics, like give you like a nice springboard. Um, I would say if a, if a band's savvy, they could do everything themselves for like 300 bucks on a Shopify. And, and that's like, you're doing the work, but that's about the cost it'll be. And then if, if you're hiring out, I would say like, probably like 2,500 bucks. Um, that's not bad. But that's, that's all super, the graphics. That, that's, that's super everything cheap. Bad. That's yeah. not that bad. Yeah. Well, the new CMS stuff, I mean, it, it like if you put out like a theme or a template, I mean, it's, the stuff is so good now. Like even, you know, Squarespace and I, I, know. I dare I say like Wix. I mean, some of these things, like they don't look half bad if you have a little bit of design sense and like you can, it's all in how you skin it and how you style it. So, I mean, yeah, if you, if you put that out, I think that would do great. I think you would sell a lot of that, but um, yeah, I mean, the sites you're putting out though, they look great, man. They they really look good. So if you're, if you're doing those for you know, anywhere, even remotely close to what you just said, that's a huge bargain. Uh, the other thing I would add to what you said is that social media, while it's great, you don't own it. You don't control it. The algorithm changes all the time. It's unpredictable. You have no freaking idea. They bury anything with a link in it anyway. So like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, especially if you're, if you got a big following on Facebook, you might have a million followers on Facebook and you make a post, see how many reactions you get on a million, you know, a page with a million followers. You, maybe you get 200, you know, maybe 200 people even see the thing, you know, 
you, you really don't have control over that, where if you own your website, you own it, you know, it's yours. It's always there. People know how to find you. And like you said, I mean, click through is obviously going to be higher. It's all in one place. So you've got retention, you've got time on screen, you know, all that stuff plays into it. So. Yeah. And you could retarget, like we set up flows and that's like a great thing is like, you can market to people that forgot about you. They could go to the link, leave, but they could get an email 24 hours later because you set up an automation of like, Hey, don't forget you went to our website. We have this new music video out. And it's like, there's so many automations that that, that also makes like hand over fist of just like bringing those people back that were like, they could have been like at work, hit the tour flyer, didn't have time to go through the dates, but then they get an email. It's like, Hey, don't forget you went to our site. And then you sell another ticket. Cause you're like, Oh yeah. You reminded them when they weren't at work that they went to your site and then it just brings them back. So yeah, some people find that that kind of stuff. I don't. I don't want to say annoying, but some people like it. Some people don't like it. I've always loved it because there are times where like you're at a stoplight, you know, or whatever. You're quickly, you know, you're between tasks. You're walking down the street and you and you do leave something in the cart. And I kind of like that reminder, like, hey, dude, you you left this in the cart. Did you want to buy it? Because sometimes you're like, oh shit, yeah, I definitely I need to buy that. I forgot to buy it, or I thought I bought it, you know, whatever. So I really do like that kind of stuff, and it's cool that you're able to do that for you know for bands. I think it's time that bands realize that like your band is a band, sure, but it's also a business. So, and I think you steal my pitches, dude. That's my pitch. <laughs> dude, I we're doing the same shit, man. We're doing the same shit. <laughs> no, it's great, man. But but it's it's true, you know, and I think that Miss May I is a, is a great example and I think that some of the work that you're putting out right now is a really really good example. People should look at you if you want a roadmap of like how to do it right, how to make your stuff look cohesive, how to have your branding and everything it, it, it's spot on, man. Like you've totally nailed it. So I'm, I'm actually surprised to hear that. Like you never went to design school. You never took development classes, anything. No, I'm it's fun. I, so the Dayton school of modern art, I'm actually speaking there September 19th about being a designer, which is so funny. Cause I wanted to go to that school and it's so crazy full circle to be like on the panel to talk about my career. Um, but yeah, I just, I would have went to school and I still like I do like schooling for coding um, on the side, not like proper school, but like um, by boot camps and stuff. Um, yeah. If life ever chilled out, I will probably go to school and try to get some classical training of it. Um, but I also like the ruggedness of now I've worked with so many contractors over the decade of being designers that like, I sort of prefer the self-taught ruggedness of design and coding because same with like music theory. It's like, I get, I butt heads with people that have music theory because like, just because there's an outline doesn't mean that's the way it has to be. Um, you can also just go off the vibe and feelings and emotions and same goes with coding and design. It's like, just because there's an accessibility thing or just because these colors scientifically don't go together doesn't mean they can't for this situation because it feels a certain way. So I, that's the other thing I do like being self-taught because, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, and I, the music theory is just what I compare it to because if people listen to a guitar player that knows music theory and a guitar player that's self-taught, it's their shreddiness is completely different. Not that one's better than the other, but you can feel the difference, you know? Well, one of so. the weirdest things that I've always found is the because I am, I, I did go to design school and like I've worked at a bunch of agencies and worked with a bunch of guys. I've got national awards and all that corny shit it it doesn't mean fuck all man like i tell you straight up like if you were to go to design school you'd probably be sorely disappointed because they're not going to start you in a graduate program like you're going to have to go through all the remedial stuff and, and it i have i review portfolios at colleges all the time man they're not doing work that look, looks as good as some of the stuff that you're putting out so it's like you you you, if you're the, the weird parallel is the musician thing. If you understand principles, like I think structuring a song, structuring a website, structuring a design, it's all the same. Like if you understand composition, symmetry and asymmetry, like where to where to make the grid, where to break the grid, how to follow things, how to disrupt things so that they're interesting, you know, I think it's it's very weird how those gestalt principles like they the rhythm and the flow of things. It's the same as writing a song. Like if you can make something interesting, you can make something interesting, you know, and exactly. I don't think you can, you, you can't teach creativity. Like I've tried, you just can't do it. You either, yep. you either get it or you don't. And it's clear that you do get it. And, and again, like I hats off, man. I love the work. If I was reviewing this portfolio, man, you pass with flying colors. So yeah, <laughs> keep you. up the good work. <laughs> so you. I think we're about out of time here. I I can't tell you, man, it's been a pleasure. I sincerely appreciate you taking the time. I know you guys are busy. 
Uh, for people who want to check out what's going on, what is the best place to go right now currently? Yeah, so we actually just got MissMayI.com back. So Miss May I Music or MissMayI.com um, all goes to the same spot. Uh, but yeah, check us out. It has um, everything on there. Today, we just announced our European tour um, of Apologies for the Week reunion. Um, it's only one week only, so we're only there for seven days. We go all through Europe and UK real quick, in and out. Um, so I hope you guys can make it out. We haven't been there in years, so that's going to be really fun. That's in December. Um, and then, yeah, new music's coming out within the, the month and new music's coming out next year. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening. So, Very cool. Very excited for the new music. Curtis, you got anything else? Nope. I think we've covered everything. All right, Levi, again, it's been a pleasure. I thank you for coming on. Everybody, this has been Heavy Business. We'll see you next time.